Well, we're heading to the home stretch, and we're going to ask now that uh, Mr. Uh, Nicholson would come uh, with uh, eulogy part two, and then we'll look forward to hearing uh, from those words, it is well with my soul. To Mrs. Elam and the entire family of our beloved brother, Dr. Michael Elam, distinguished guests, and each of you who have found this memorial process worthy of your time. I'll not stand before you long as I'm aware of the sensitivity of days like this. When a man has earned the right to be remembered with the highest of regards, yet with each passing moment, it can be difficult for his family. One definition of leadership is the ability to inspire a team to achieve a certain goal. And I'm honored that I've been entrusted to share a few simple thoughts about someone who I called a mentor and a friend. And in truth, when I first saw Dr. Elam, it was during when he initially came to the college. He gave a speech that at that time didn't seem all that special to me, except for maybe the final five minutes that it was most unusual of a statement to hear from a man newly elected to the role of president. While I had been both in his position before and seen many others in the past, I'd never heard someone make the following statement. He let each of us know that his leadership style was one of inclusion. Yet at the end of the day, the responsibilities lay on his shoulder. Then he proceeded to let us know that when his work day was over, he would be leaving as soon as possible because there was no greater priority in his life than his wife and his family. And while I and many of you perhaps left that meeting chuckling about that statement, Dr. Elam wasted no time ensuring us that it was not just conversation, but it was a lifestyle and one that I would grow over time to envy. I found myself sometime later assuming a role that included special assistant to the president. And initially that seemed like just a title with no real purpose because he and I rarely interacted and he went about his leadership responsibilities and I went about my daily task. And as I found myself sitting in meetings, listening to my colleagues go through what appeared to be hours and hours and hours of issues that dealt with the growth and advancement of this great institution, I began to watch his response to the team. And again, I wasn't truly impressed. But I guess my body language must have shown it because one night I received a call from Dr. Elam. And his question was simple. You don't like these meetings, do you? And I asked him, sir, might I be candid? And he said, you may. And I said, sir, I don't know why these meetings take so long. And I do not think that they should take so long. But this wise and even kill leader, he didn't get mad, didn't get smart with me, but he asked me a question. He said, how much time should I give leaders to determine solutions to problems that impact more than a thousand students and more than a hundred employees? And I found myself quiet without an answer. And he said, while I could make that decision, I appreciate the minds of the people in the room because they may bring something that I have yet to factor. He said to me, instead of watching the clock on your cell phone, why not engage? And that was the beginning of my mentorship. Over time, he would ask me questions and I became more confident in offering my views. But in truth, I still felt like he was a little soft. And I felt this because coming from the military, I was not only used to more aggressive and firm stance, I was not used to inclusive and non-confrontational leadership styles. 
And one day he came by my office and he requested that I walk with him. And he asked me questions about my family, more specifically my mother and things that had absolutely nothing to do with the institution. And he remembered that months earlier she had lost her brother. And we circled those halls and we arrived back at my office door, simply shook hands and went back to doing normal business. And I learned that day that he knew things about me that I had personally not shared with him. And over time, I was blessed to share many conversations about things that most of you would consider to be nothing. But to me, it was learning a new way to think about being a leader. And even more so, learning new ways to think about being a man. You see, as a Negro male who grew up 17 miles from here in Jackson, it was not uncommon to see young men without a positive male role model in the home. And unfortunately, it's 2022, and that divide still exists in this region. But in truth, over my entire lifetime, it has been more common to hear about minority males who failed as men, who failed as husbands, and certainly who failed as fathers. So to witness a man in the position of president, a man who looks like me, from a small town like me, who not only held that title, but did so without compromising his faith or his family, a man who refused to believe that he lost an edge by being open about his love for his wife and his love for Christ, a man that made it to the level of college president in the South, but was comfortable enough about who he was to have regular conversations about regular things to regular people. And in a society where business is truly cutthroat, he never believed in the backstabbing and gamesmanship that we have normalized in business. He once stated to me that I control what I can control, and the rest will take care of itself. And while there were many occasions where he and I shared conversation that shall remain private, I can remember countless times where his humanity overshadowed the situations he found himself in and reinforced my growing affinity for that man who unknowingly became my mentor. He was a teacher of men. He was soft-spoken, yet his delivery was very purposeful. He always included a thing that would be a nugget left in your mind. And there was a time when I went to him to introduce him to a new hired employee. And Dr. Elam was the final stop on the list of people to meet. And the young man sat down thinking that he was going to be grilled about his skill set and his qualifications. But to both of our surprise, Every question from this president was about the positive future of this new employee. It was about that employee's family and how he could useful to leadership and improving the operation and culture of this organization. And I'll not put that employee on Front Street right now because he is certainly sitting amongst us. And as we begin to leave his office, he said to this young man, from now on, I want you to look anyone you are speaking to in the eye. He said, you deserve to be here. And when you look a man in the eye and speak to him, he can look at you and determine your level of sin sincerity. He shook that young man's hand and then we left. And this life lesson again proves that this great leader was about mentorship and uplifting, not just about numbers and titles. And before I leave, I wanna share one final true story about the complexity of Dr. Michael Elam. I told you all I didn't think he was firm enough. Matter of fact, I said I thought he was soft sometimes. But I wanna share with you a time when Dr. Elam momentarily changed that thought in my mind. He had given me a task that he believed I failed to carry out to the letter. He voiced his displeasure to which I disagreed to the context. But I moved on as it comes with the job. 
And later that night, I opened my email to find a written letter of reprimand. And as I was reading it, the reprimand truly bothered me. And now I don't let much bother me in terms of hurt. But this write-up hurt, not because it was a write-up, but because a part of his write-up essentially said he was disappointed and that I sought to undermine his leadership by failing to carry out his directives to the letter. Uh, Halifax Community College and distinguished guest. He picked a fine time to want to show me he was tough. And I also felt like it was unfair. Because when you have someone that you value their views and they say that they are disappointed, it hurts you inside. And to top it off, I hadn't done what he was accusing me of doing. And it bothered me that entire weekend. And Dr. Elam continued to reach out to me over the weekend, but I refused to take his calls. And I'm sure he knew I felt some kind of way because I never not answered his calls regardless to the time of day or night. In fact, I was boiling. And I wrote him a sincere letter explaining why I disagreed with his conclusion and that because he expressed a lack of confidence that I'd be resigning. And Monday morning, he summoned me to his office. And I marched there with every office key separated from my personal keys. And as I entered into his office, his first words were, your request to resign is not approved. You serve at the pleasure of the president. And while I'll not share the entirety of that conversation, one piece describes the real man, the real leader, the real person, and how his faith was always a part of him. He said to me as he looked me dead in my eyes, I want to apologize to you. And the rest of that conversation shall remain private. Halifax Community College and distinguished guest. In my lifetime, I am a better leader for knowing Dr. Elam. However, Miss Maxine, in that same lifetime, I'm a better man for knowing Michael. Because the test of leadership is not about how many times you say your title. It is not about how many people are in your chain of command. Leadership is not about how many people you can maneuver or manipulate. It's not about the number of times your name is in the newspaper clippings. And it's not about how many times someone can mint your name on a plaque. Leadership is about how you are in the core of your being. Whatever type of value system do you really have? You cannot buy values. You must build values. You don't give a care. You have to express it. You don't make people respect you. They have to choose to. And we all have an impression that we will leave on others that we encounter. However, the type of that impression is determined by the condition of your interaction and the content of your character. What Dr. Elam left each of you will be different. And you can decide based on your own personal ideologies if you liked or disliked his style. But what is undeniable is this, I dare any of you in this place right now or the thousands who are accessing this solemn event through social media to find a better combination of a leader, a husband, a father, a mentor, and a confidant than Dr. Michael Elam. To Miss Maxine, you and your children have given so much over the years. You have shared Dr. Elam on many days, hours, and minutes with us all. The debt incurred by being married to a leader of society is now paid. The emotional, professional, and political account is now zero balanced. And I pray that my Lord and Savior will shorten the hours of hurt and increase the amount of love you feel in remembering a man with an uncanny love for you, a leader of men that you helped to build, that you supported, 
that you walked with, that you stood by, and you defended until this very day. You have exhibited the grace and the elegance in this most difficult of times, befitting to any wife of any president. And I salute you in this moment. This moment shall be engraved with our hearts and minds, and may God continue to bless you. 